This is Frank Harrell at Vanderbilt University, Department of Biostatistics. Uh, this material is from uh, a set of notes called Biostatistics for Biomedical Research, uh, which contains a, a great variety of material uh, that will be of interest to biomedical researchers who want to learn about statistics and statistical ideas. Uh, I will be covering um, chapter 10, and, and this is the first video in a series uh, to study uh, simple linear regression and multiple regression. This material serves as a prerequisite for the regression modeling strategies course. We will deal with chapter 10 of these slides. Um, and we start with um, this video about simple linear regression. Uh, before going into linear regression, it's a good idea to take stock of the various alternatives to regression, um, such as stratification and matching. And the idea is to be able to hold a variable constant, such as a variable x1, uh, when we're estimating the effect of another variable, x2, uh, that's part of uh, multiple regression, in this case with two predictors. Uh, in simple linear regression, we don't have x2, but we're just studying the effect of varying x1. Uh, but you can hold variables constant and study effects of other variables using matching and stratification. Um, and also, the very best way to do this is by experimental manipulation of one of the variables where you can really control the situation and hold all the other variables constant uh, for real. Uh, but stratification on x1 is a way to hold x1 constant, especially if x1 is not a continuous variable and you can create distinct groups on the values of x1. You can, uh, for each stratum, analyze the relationship between x2 and y, so that is holding x1 constant. Another approach to holding x1 constant is to form matched sets of observations on the basis of x1, and then use statistical methods applicable to matched data. But we'll be talking about a regression model, um, and the way regression models work is they allow you to study the effects of multiple variables um, and adjust for multiple variables. And the way that you hold the effect of a variable constant is to estimate how that uh, variable relates to the outcome variable, y, and essentially to subtract that relationship, leaving what's left is the relationship between x1 and y. And in ordinary regression, you can actually uh, predict y um, on the basis of x1 and subtract those predicted values from y to get y prime and then regress uh, y prime on x2 to study the x2 effect adjusted for x1. Um, so regression is all about algebra. It's all about uh, artificially holding variables constant, and it's also all about getting predictions and making statistical inferences. Uh, stratification and matching do not generalize extremely well. Uh, they don't work very well in the context of continuous variables or where there's many variables to hold constant. Um, many practitioners like matching because it's easy to describe uh, and easy to understand, but it usually results in discarding observations. And that's especially unfortunate when uh, you discard observations that really would have been great matches for, for uh, other observations. And so uh, some studies end up discarding a very large number of, of uh, observations that were not needed uh, in the matching process. Um, so matching um, discards a lot of information, and that ends up losing power and precision. And the observations discarded are often quite arbitrary uh, and may depend on the order of observations that were in the data set, or in other words, how the data set was sorted. 
the rows of the data set, and, and that would damage a study's reproducibility. Um, and so uh, matching is somewhat arbitrary, and there's no truly principled, magical, uh, unique approach in statistics to analyzing matched data. Um, and, and so there's many uh, advantages to using regression adjustment. Uh, this material uh, that we're going to skip right now just goes through a detailed examples showing how matching can work and how it can be arbitrary and result in discarding observations that are valuable, that contain valuable data. So we're going to be spending the rest of our time on um, statistical modeling and uh, we start with the purposes of statistical models. Uh, the, the book uh, Regression Modeling Strategies in Chapter 1 uh, and the first section of that chapter has uh, expanded material about this. So one purpose of uh, statistical analysis is hypothesis testing, um, and hypothesis testing has recently been criticized a great deal, especially null hypothesis testing, in which you set up a straw man, uh, a hypothesis of no effect, and try to bring evidence against that hypothesis. Uh, so you're testing, for example, for no association of a predictor or independent variable uh, with a response or a dependent variable, uh, which is a kind of unadjusted test. Um, and so a hypothesis test might be thought of as a test of whether the relationship between X and Y is flat. Uh, you can also be interested in estimation. Uh, so you might want to estimate the shape of the relationship between an independent variable and the dependent variable. Uh, you might want to estimate the steepness of that relationship and so on. Um, estimation, a very common uh, need is to estimate the effect of the response variable on changing one of the predictor value variables from one value to another. For example, the effect of increasing your cholesterol from 150 to 200. Prediction is in some ways a generalization of those two areas of hypothesis testing and estimation. And in the last few years, more people have been interested in prediction. Uh, so in prediction, we're interested in predicting response tendencies, uh, such as long-term average response as a function of the predictors. Uh, or we're interested in predicting the outcomes or responses of individual subjects or individual units. Now modeling has a lot of advantages over hypothesis testing. Uh, when Even when you have um, a, a null hypothesis you want to test, um, a pr alternatives to modeling have some disadvantages. Uh, Permutation and rank tests can perform very well and be very robust, but they're not as useful for estimation as st statistical modeling is. And you cannot readily extend permutation tests and some nonparametric tests to, to com complex situations such as cluster sampling or repeated measurements. Models generalize tests. Um, the two sample t-test as well as ANOVA for comparing a number of groups are just special cases of multiple linear regression. So you could argue that it's better to learn regression instead of learning a bunch of special cases. Uh, the Wilcoxon and Kruska-Wallace and Spearman tests are uh, thought of as special cases of the proportional odds ordinal logistic model. Uh, so if you use the proportional odds model, you don't really need these other tests as much, and you can do covariate adjustment, which those other tests do not allow. Uh, in the world of survival analysis or time to event analysis, uh, the log rank test is just a special case of the Cox proportional hazards model. 
Uh, you will sometimes uh, read a paper where the authors say they didn't believe the proportional hazards assumption was satisfied, and so they used the log rank test instead of the Cox model. Well, that's a very silly argument because any method that's a special case of another method uh, makes all of the assumptions that the other method makes. So we might as well just be using the Cox model even for just a simple two-group comparison of failure times. Models have another advantage in that they uh, not only allow for multiplicity adjustment for p-values, uh, but they allow for multiplicity adjustment of point estimates. Uh, that may sound a little strange to some people, but if you're using random effects uh, models or you're using shrinkage or penalized maximum likelihood estimates, uh, that is actually um, shrinking estimates perhaps towards a common uh, grand mean uh, and shrinking estimates, for example, when you're reporting uh, mortality statistics on hundreds of hospitals in the United States, uh, shrinking these estimates allows for more accurate estimates and that really is thought of as a kind of multiplicity adjustment. Um, if you um, If you look at uh, p-value adjustment, that, that will handle multiplicity correction. But uh, if you were to look at the difference between the most different treatments, if you had several treatments that were competing, uh, that difference is a biased estimate of the difference of those two treatments. A uh, random effects model could uh, give you more realistic estimates. Uh, statistical estimation is usually model-based, and in many cases you cannot get an estimate without a model. If you wanted to know what is the effect of raising cholesterol from 200 to 250 milligrams per deciliter on the hazard of death holding other factors constant, there's absolutely no way to get that without a model. You can try, for example, you might uh, compare those with a cholesterol above 225 to those with the cholesterol below 225, but uh, the actual interpretation of that number, that say a hazard ratio that comes out of that comparison, is ill-defined and, and is really impossible to define. Whereas the regression estimate, you, you get a predicted value at 250 and a predicted value at 200, subtract those two numbers and you have an estimate of the effect of exactly going from 200 to 250. Now we're usually interested in adjusted effects or partial effects in statistical analysis and we're really seldom very interested in marginal or crude effects. So models use conditioning in order to give us the the appropriate effects uh, that we're really interested in, such as subject-specific effects. Um, now we're going to get into a, a little bit of a detour at this point, which is to discuss very briefly non-parametric regression. Um, sounds a little out of place, but it's a good thing to remember that linear regression is a special case of a much more general set of methodologies and makes quite restrictive assumptions about shapes of relationships. Um, and so in uh, section 2.4.7 of the Regression Modeling Strategies book, as well as uh, section 17.8 of the Analysis of Biological Data book, uh, there's a discussion of, of uh, these, this uh, section. So we may be interested in estimating the tendency of a response variable y as a function of a continuous variable x, and non-parametric regression allows us to do that with very few assumptions. And this is especially handy method to have in your toolbox when there's only a single predictor of interest, uh, and in that case, your final plotted uh, your final result might be the plotted trend line that comes from the non-parametric method. So the oldest kind of non-parametric method is a moving average, and um, I won't go into details here, but you can see that if you wanted to estimate 
uh, y as a function of x, you can have moving intervals of x, and for each interval of x, you can calculate the average y uh, as your estimate of the uh, mean of y given x, uh, given x is at the center of the x's you averaged over. So that's just what this exercise is going through. Um, when you think about a moving average, uh, you can see immediately that if you wanted to get an estimate of the mean y when x is 1, uh, you cannot do that with a moving average because you don't have anything to the left of that to average over. Uh, whereas when you get to the interior points, you can average over left and right observations to get the, the estimate of the mean y at the right target value. Um, so we have a problem with moving averages which are really moving flat lines. They have this edge problem and the moving average is very sensitive to the width of the bin that you're using. Um, in this case we're using three observations for our, our bins. And so instead of dwelling on um, moving averages, we really like to use uh, moving lines or moving curves instead of moving flat lines or moving averages. And uh, the most common approach uh, that uses that philosophy is the low S method uh, that was created by Bill Cleveland, and that's a locally weighted least squares approach uh, that is a, essentially a moving linear regression uh, where you move one unique X point at a time and fit a local linear regression that's weighted and by moving and refitting these slopes and intercepts and not forcing the slope to be zero as a moving average does, uh, you have a lot of flexibility and really excellent performance in the, uh, in the estimates. Uh, now this is an example, um, and you can see the R code uh, for analyzing the data after retrieving it from the internet. This is an example of using a nonparametric smoother um, and we're getting the uh, estimate of the relationship between the total polymorph count uh, of these blood cell types in the cerebrospinal fluid versus the, um, the average uh, of the ratio of the amount of gluco glucose in the cerebrospinal fluid uh, versus the amount of glucose found in the blood and there are little tick marks placed where the data actually occur. So these are called rug plots showing where the density of the ratios are and on this axis the density of the total polymorph count. And you can see that this relationship is uh, not anywhere close to being a linear relationship. Um, and if you were to use an ordinary uh, linear regression to relate uh, one, one variable to another here, uh, you would be fitting a line that would be correct at only two points, and it would be pretty, uh, pretty terrible fit of that line. So nonparametric regression is a great tool. Uh, it's something that may be sufficient for some of your projects, especially if you don't need to adjust for other variables. This is um, another kind of uh, nonparametric regression using what's called a super smoother which can handle some pretty complex relationships so this is based on a data set of over 400 subjects including a lot of infants presenting to the emergency room with symptoms of meningitis and uh, as a function of age we want to understand what is the probability that in the differential diagnosis that the patient will be ultimately diagnosis having bacterial meningitis as opposed to viral meningitis. So uh, if you were to fit a linear regression to this, you would sort of make a flat relationship that would be wrong except at three points. And you can see a very, very sharp relationship here that peaks at about age one year, uh, which might be because of weaning from breastfeeding and some loss of immunity, don't know for sure and then a very rapid fall in the relative uh, fraction of uh, patients presenting in the emergency room that ultimately are shown to have bacterial meningitis, reaching a minimum at around age 23 and then creeping back up. So a very complex relationship 
uh, that would not be captured anywhere near correctly using ordinary regression methods, especially if you were to assume linearity. We have uh, other regression methods that will model uh, this kind of relationship using spline functions. So in the next uh, video, we're going to uh, get into simple linear regression.